is kind of, we want to take a look at the big picture, not just the big picture of here. We're going to start here, but we want to do the big picture as it applies to the world, the world of the Permian, the world of what it was, what it was like then. And I'm going to start with Jerry. Can you tell us where we are and what we're seeing? Well, we're up uh, one canyon in uh, Prehistoric Trackways National Monument. I think it's one of the more beautiful canyons. And one of the largest uh, trackway sites is right behind us. Uh, I call it AF-10. And you've got literally hundreds of these layers, and they're like pages of a book. If we were to look at this whole mountain, I, uh, the red bed layer down here would be one volume. Let's say it's 100 pages long. And we can look at all these tracks in these hundred pages. But what's so cool about this whole mountain is you've got the encyclopedia. So you've got this volume, and then this volume, and then this volume, and then this volume. So the, the cool thing about it is the Earth keeps books. It records the history of life on this planet. And this is an excellent example of a place that had a lot of activity that really scientifically we know virtually nothing about. We're right on the cutting edge of really understanding this period of time so long ago. So One of the things I want to touch on then is these red beds. Something else that's inside these red beds are plants. Yes. And uh, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about the plants and what that tells us or can at least hints at in terms of the climate of the past? Well, the plant uh, diversity here is low, for one thing. It's primarily conifers. Modern uh, relatives, most people will be familiar. They're not close relatives, but things you know, used for your average Christmas tree. Um, and this, these beds are variably full of them, uh, and, and not a whole lot of diversity. So as we saw in marine rocks at some other point where there were many species, here you have very, relatively low um, uh, variability in the types of plants. We presume that there were forests of these somewhere nearby. How nearby, we're not exactly sure because uh, they're mostly floated into the environments where we find them. So we're probably looking at some stands of conifers. These kinds of plants, as far as we know, from the kinds of rocks they're in and the, what the, the rocks tell us about climate and so on, is that they're in seasonally dry environments. So we're probably looking at a landscape that uh, has rainfall certainly in it, but the rainfall is probably seasonally distributed. Let me go from that and come over here uh, to Spencer. Uh, we've heard that this is probably a seasonal environment. We've, we've talked about these red beds, the things that are on them. What were these red beds or that we see here, these thinly bedded, or in some cases thicker bedded rocks? Right, well we know at this time that there were mountains to the north of us and to the northeast. These are what geologists call the ancestral Rocky Mountains. And they were really created by the collision of the continents that occurred some million years before these rocks were formed, or at least it began. So as the continents came together to make one supercontinent, the crumpling of the crust created what we call the ancestral Rocky Mountains in the western United States. And from these ancestral Rocky Mountains, rivers were flowing down into vast flood basins. And this was the edge of one of those big flood basins as it came down to meet the shoreline. The red rocks you see are layers of sand and silt that represent what, what a geologist would call sheet flooding, just, just literally sand and, and water just being flooded over vast, nearly flat surfaces. And those sheet floods were probably at the extreme ends of big river systems that were to the north of us. So the big rivers would have flown down out of the uh, uh, ancestral Rockies. They would have hit the flood basin, and then the basin was so flat that all that would happen is there'd be these vast floods where red, the red sand and silt came out with water. And then finally, here in the Plato's, it met the shoreline. So these sands and silts were deposited right along the edge of the Permian Sea. Let's take the, when you said to the north, I think it's a great segue because now we can talk about where were we at this time. If I take my GPS out today right now, actually I can't tell you what the latitude is, I need to take it out to see. 32 degrees. 32, there we go. Uh, but where were we when these were being deposited? As far as we can tell, we were almost dead on the equator. We were within a few degrees of the equator. So we were in the equatorial zone, the tropical zone. And this area was on the western edge of the vast supercontinent, which we call Pangaea. So there were shallow seas, embayments along that western shoreline. And this, we call, I would call it the Hueco Seaway, after the, the rock formation, the Hueco Formation or Hueco Group. This Hueco Seaway 
was in here coming in from a, a bigger ocean that was out to the west of us and here in this equatorial uh, tropics. And for this particular site, we're gonna come back to Jerry now, because now I think we can see what the big picture was for our continent. Uh, we can see what the general climate, hopefully we can see, or at least have an idea what the general climate was like. And now we can come back to these trackways that Jerry found, along with the plant fossils that are here, and hopefully see the, the, the big picture to the small picture. Well, it, what, what's fascinating to me, and, and, and uh, when I went to school and, you know, you get these little fossil books that have descriptions of all these marine fossils and bones or skulls or teeth or things that everybody's no, no, got. No plants. Yeah, no plants, and, sorry. And plants. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't anything that had uh, footprints. And for some bizarre reason, I never in my wildest imagination thought of fossil footprints. So when I first saw three little uh, fossil footprints in a case, I mean, I was stunned and I was hooked. And I think the main reason was, if you, are, if you think about how hard it is to make a footprint and keep it a footprint for 280 million years, I mean, that footprint is still there. It is a representative sample of a living creature. Bones, that tells us about the, the animal, it doesn't even necessarily tell us where it died. And we can try to put it together, but we don't really have a lot of uh, confidence as to what it looked like until we find how these animals moved. And with the dinosaurs, we used to think of, of them as uh, heavy and plodding, and now we, we've got these really efficient, cool-looking trackways and all that. But anyway, here, I, uh, you've got these layers and layers and layers of big tracks of pelicosaurs, tiny tracks of uh, small amphibians. You've got insects, arthropods, all kinds of uh, various types of uh, living animals, all preserved on these delicate pages. And it tells us a lot about how these footprints are made. They have to be a real deformable surface, but it has to be protected if there was a lot of wave energy, uh, it would, they would be destroyed. So to me, it's just a remarkable record, even more important, I think, than, than finding an isolated skeleton that just has paid, it, it's, it's just the record, the encyclopedia of the earth writing about this whole period of time. It's a record that we can see here, uh, that, that maybe perhaps other people will be able to see as well, that informs us not only of what was, things were like here, but of the larger picture of the world. Mm -hmm.